Hello fellow LEGO friends and welcome back to another episode of Medieval Adventures. I'm excited to fulfill your requests with a review of LEGO set number 10305, The Lion Knight's Castle. Now, I must admit, I initially had some reservations about this set. It didn't quite capture my attention like others and I couldn't understand the hype surrounding it. However, I stand corrected. This set is nothing short of phenomenal. But before we delve into the details, don't forget to subscribe, like, comment, and if you haven't already added this gem to your collection, consider purchasing it through the provided links. Let's delve into the building process of this colossal set. Its sheer size took me by surprise. I wasn't prepared for its grandeur. As you begin construction, you'll first tackle what I'd call the civilian side, followed by the castle itself. These two sections can be separated for easier access to the intricate interiors. Let's start by examining the exterior. At first glance, the set might appear modest, given its primarily grey colour palette, a common characteristic of medieval castles. However, upon closer inspection, you'll notice subtle touches of colour, such as the greenery peeking through the stones and the Tudor-style house, which adds a delightful contrast. Now, let's delve deeper into each section for a closer look. Starting on the right side, you'll encounter the tallest structure, the gatehouse or guardhouse. This tower appears simple at first glance, adorned only with a black tree reminiscent of the forest hideout set. But wait, what's this? A hidden cave behind a rock formation, perhaps a secret refuge for Robin Hood. And to my surprise, this rock can be slid aside to reveal a hidden escape route. This castle is brimming with hidden surprises. But let's take a moment to appreciate the small touches that adorn the castle's otherwise plain colours, such as the bee nest that adds a pop of colour, though unfortunately, no bees are included. You may also notice a small knob, but I'll explain its significance later. The gatehouse, along with the other towers, features finished merlins and various flags, with the largest flag proudly displaying the symbol of the Lion Knights. The top portions of the structures are adorned with charming corbel machicolations. Additionally, you'll spot small windows serving as arrow slits for castle defense, an elegantly simple yet effective building technique. As you progress, you'll encounter various window types throughout the castle, each a joy to build. Now, let's explore the back of the castle, where another watchtower stands proudly alongside a quaint dock, complete with stairs leading up to the castle. These stairs employ a brilliant building technique, seamlessly integrated into the design. But wait, there's a gate blocking the way. Fear not, for hidden on one side of the watchtower is a knob that operates this gate, showcasing yet another clever and simple building technique. This side of the castle is also fortified with numerous arrow slits for defence. Above the dock, a formidable castle defence system awaits, with small holes designed for hurling grenades at approaching enemies. An aureal window, utilising a different window style from the rest of the castle, adds an intriguing architectural touch. Beneath the aureal window lies a mysterious brown frog, though whether it's a frog or a brownie remains a mystery for now. Moving to the civilian side, you'll immediately notice a distinct architectural style. At the ground level, small windows provide ventilation from within. The windows on the first floor are adorned with delicate flowers, while hints of greenery peek through the stone structure. The pinnacle of this section features a Tudor-style house in classic black and white, crowned with a charming thatched roof. Transitioning to another side of the castle, you'll find a fully functional watermill in action. Above the watermill, a balcony stands ready, evoking thoughts of Romeo and Juliet, although neither of them are included in this set. Additional watchtowers adorn this section of the castle, adding to its grandeur and defensive capabilities. Finally, let's take a look at the front of the castle. What immediately grabs your attention are the intricate angles used to give the castle its impressive, not blocky appearance. These angles are executed flawlessly, seamlessly connecting with each other to enhance the overall aesthetics of the castle. 
Without these angles, the castle wouldn't look as visually striking as it does now. On the left side, you'll find a curtain wall with several arrow slits, adding to the defensive features of the castle. Meanwhile, on the right side, the main entrance to the castle awaits. Climbing the steep approach, you'll notice there's limited space for minifigures due to the lack of studs. The main watchtower proudly overlooks the moats, flanked by several arrow slits on both sides. In the middle section, two coats of arms and a beautifully decorated window catch the eye. Notably, there's a fully functional portcullis, although it lacks a knob for operation. To raise the portcullis, simply rotate this Technic wheel, accompanied by a pleasing sound. Lowering it is just a matter of applying slight pressure. One side of the watchtower is embellished with an additional Oriel window. Stepping onto the drawbridge, you'll be mesmerized by the stunning archways. The use of two shades of grey effectively highlights the depth of these archways. However, if the portcullis is closed, you may wonder how to gain entry. No one appears to be home and there's no doorbell. So, how exactly do I get in? Turning the knob mentioned earlier reveals yet another surprise, a fully functional drawbridge granting access to explore the castle's interior. Beneath the drawbridge lies another secret entrance to the castle, showcasing the set's penchant for concealed delights. As mentioned previously, you have the option to detach the two sections from each other, but you can also open the castle like a dollhouse, similar to what we saw with the Home Alone set. As you slide down from the drawbridge, you find yourself in the dungeons, where two jail cells await. One cell even has a secret escape route behind a sliding rock wall, as I demonstrated earlier. However, if you find yourself in the other cell, your fate may be similar to its current occupant. Moving upward, there's a stable for the Queen's horse on one side, while a ladder leads to the armory on the other side, filled with equipment. This area also features a small archway leading to the courtyard. Removing the middle stand on a second floor reveals the intricate mechanisms behind the bridge and portcullis, offering insight into the castle's defense system. Unfortunately, there are no ladders or stairs to reach the highest point of any of the towers. Turning to the left, we come across a few grenades ready to be hurled at any enemy approaching from the docks mentioned earlier. Further along the left corner, we find a medieval toilet, confirming whether the earlier discovery was indeed a chocolate frog or a brownie. Descending further, we observe the workings of the gate from the dock and to its right, another room equipped with additional armor and shields. This castle boasts an abundance of battlements and shields, making it well prepared for any potential enemy assault. Returning to ground level, a treasure chest concealed beneath the staircase contains coins. Moving to the central part, although not accessible from this side, detaching each section reveals a hidden room, possibly the clandestine meeting place of the Black Falcons. This room can be accessed through a trapdoor under the courtyard food stand or via a cave tunnel near the castle's entrance. Inside, there's a small table with a map and two chairs, along with a target on the wall for Robin Hood's archery practice. Moving upward, the food stand mentioned earlier offers delicious baguettes or oranges. To the left, small stairs lead to a raised platform for keeping an eye on approaching enemies. At the back, a system of stairs leads to different levels of this part of the castle. Descending the stairs, we encounter a charming spring at the ground floor. Here, a well-appointed kitchen awaits, complete with pretzels, jars, and a wood oven on one side, while a table laden with food delicacies like croissant and parsnips occupies the other. It's a curious mix of cultures, as pretzels and croissants likely wouldn't have been served together in medieval times. Moving up, despite lacking an entrance door, we find a cosy room with a fireplace and a log with an axe in the middle, along with a small piano in the corner. The yellow and blue decoration at the top of the room adds a nice touch. Ascending to the highest point, passing through a very narrow door, we find ourselves in a child's room with a tiny yellow castle model, a nostalgic nod to classic Lego sets. Stepping outside, we spot a non-functional bell tower that adds additional charm to the set. Remember the Juliet balcony mentioned earlier? It transforms into a walkway when unfolded, a clever touch that also conceals a golden frog. 
While the significance of the frog may elude me, I can't help but admire the clever engineering behind it. Climbing the ladder leads us to another watchtower. Moving to the right, we find a compact yet functional bedroom, featuring a single bed on one side, a bedside table with a letter and quill in the middle, and a fireplace on the other side. Descending further, we arrive at a tiny dining hall adorned with a sizable table and two chairs crafted by a woodworker from the town square. The walls are decorated with various shields, complemented by the delightful yellow and blue wall decorations at the top. Finally, we enter the last room, which reveals the purpose of the water wheel, adding a charming touch to the castle's interior. This water wheel isn't just for show, it's fully functional, transforming hay bales into flour to bake delicious bread. Additionally, this room features various other details, such as a closet and a bird nestled in the rafters. Below the bird's nest, freshly baked baguettes await to be sold in the food stand in the courtyard. Now, let's delve into the impressive selection of minifigures included in this set. In total, there are 21 regular minifigures plus one additional figure, along with an ox, two horses, a baby lamb, and several frogs in various colors. With such a diverse range of minifigures, let's categorize them for clarity. We can group them into several categories, such as family of forest men, peasants, black falcons, lion knights, and lastly, the esteemed wizard. We start with what I'd affectionately dub the family of Robin Hood, comprised of a father, mother, and daughter, representing the forest dwelling characters akin to those of the legendary outlaw. Moving on to the peasants of the castle, we introduce a noteworthy addition, a female civilian adorned with a splendid new piece for her medieval hair covering, undoubtedly a prized collectible for its unique headpiece. This exclusive figure enriches the set's diversity. Following her, we have a child sporting one of the newer hair pieces, another civilian utilizing the torso and legs from the medieval blacksmith shop, and lastly, the farmer armed with his trusty pitchfork. Alongside the farmer is his ox, diligently pulling a small wagon build, a delightful inclusion absent from this year's medieval town square set. Turning our attention to the legendary Black Falcons, revered characters hailing from one of the castle line's most esteemed factions, we encounter a standard foot soldier proudly bearing the blue and yellow banner a black falcon knight astride a tan horse bedecked with black falcon horse barding, and lastly, the humble patsy burdened with all their gear. These three minifigures evoke waves of nostalgia and excitement among fans loyal to this iconic faction. Continuing on, we have the Lion Knights, featuring nine warriors and their queen. While the warriors share the same prints for their torsos and leg pieces, each showcases a unique facial expression. Among them are axe wielders, a trumpet player, archers, and a knight riding a horse donning the barding piece in red. The Lion Knight Queen boasts an exclusive print for her torso and leg pieces, along with a printed cape made of the old cape material. With a hairpiece adorned with a crown, she's prepared for both diplomacy and battle. Lastly, we revisit the wizard character, a nostalgic callback to the original wizard from the old castle theme. While his inclusion is fantastic, the absence of printing on his attire is a missed opportunity for some magical detailing. The set, designated as set number 10305, Lion Knight's Castle, comes with a price tag of 400 American dollars or euros or 345 British pounds, boasting an impressive 4,514 bricks. If I've managed to convince you to purchase this set, please consider using the provided links. The packaging for this model is equally striking, showcasing captivating images of the castle set against a nostalgic yellow backdrop, a delightful nod to fans of the classic Lego era. Each section of the castle comes with its own manual, allowing for collaborative building experiences. It took me approximately three to four hours to complete each section, totaling around seven to eight hours overall. What sets these manuals apart is their extensive exploration of the castle theme's history, unlike the newer design seen in recent LEGO sets. They delve into the design philosophy behind this new castle, paying homage to its predecessors, and even feature messages from the design team, a commendable addition. 
However, the real highlight lies in the narration throughout the building process. As you assemble the set, you'll encounter entertaining quotes from characters within, hinting at Easter eggs and sharing intriguing tidbits, a delightful touch that enhances the building experience. In summary, this set delivers an outstanding building experience, captivating story elements, delightful surprises, and an abundance of fantastic minifigures. Despite my initial skepticism, I wholeheartedly recommend this set. It exceeded all my expectations. Its sheer size is truly phenomenal and is bound to capture everyone's attention. Thank you for sticking with me until the end, and I invite you to share your thoughts in the comments section. Do you already own this castle, or are you considering adding it to your collection in the future? What aspects of the set do you appreciate the most, and are there any areas where you feel it could be improved? I look forward to hearing from you, and until next time, happy building.